Hi, everyone, and welcome to Revival Lost Southern Voices 2023, a festival for readers where we celebrate historically excluded, erased, or marginalized Southern authors whose works are either out of print or otherwise do not receive the attention uh, they deserve. I'm Gina Flowers, an Associate Chair of English at Georgia State University Perimeter College, and I'm Director of Revival Lost Southern Voices. On behalf of GSU Perimeter College and the Georgia Center for the Book, we welcome you to our fourth panel entitled Tennessee Born Writers and the South. By the end of our four-day festival, our goal is for you to have a nice long reading list of authors who are new to you. We hope you'll enjoy, read, share, and help us to revive these Lost Southern Voices. Uh, as a start to your reading list, you'll find a link to the full program in the chat so you can learn more about our authors and all of our panelists. Um, a few Zoom reminders before we get started. At the top or the bottom of your screen, you'll see several symbols. You'll see the Q&A um, icon. That is to enter your questions there, please, so they don't get too lost in the chat. Um, the chat, obviously, is to chat and to interact with other attendees and the panelists. And then we also have the uh, live transcript closed captioning activated. So uh, please just click on CC at the bottom or top of your screen to see that. You can also adjust the font size there. Um, our moderator for today's panel is Melanie McGee Bianchi, and she is the author of The Ballad of Cherry Stoke and Other Stories, a collection of short fiction published in 2022 by Blackwater Press and distributed in the U.S. and the U.K. The title story and book received national acclaim, respectively, in the Mississippi Review and in the short stories category of the 2022 NYC Big Book Awards. Other stories in the book have appeared in print literary magazines from Atlanta to Ireland. Melanie has worked as a lifestyle journalist for more than 25 years and is currently the editor of three magazines, Asheville Made, Bold Life, and Carolina Home and Garden. She has published hundreds of feature articles under her own name and various pseudonyms, as well as poetry and humor essays. Melanie has received Pushcart Prize nominations for poetry and fiction, was a finalist for the Black Warrior Review Chapbook Poetry Prize, and holds a gold award for special section editing from the International Festivals and Events Association. Melanie lives with her husband and teenage son in beautiful Asheville, North Carolina. Now, as we celebrate and revive Han, Superman, and Scarborough, I welcome you all to Revival Lost Southern Voices, and I turn the panel over to our moderator, Melanie McGee Bianchi. Melanie? Oh, thank you, Gina. Um, I, I'd like to uh, introduce our, our three panelists speaking on uh, Tennessee authors. And first up, we have Jim Clark, who will be speaking about Mildred Hahn. Jim Clark was born in Birdstown, Tennessee. He is Professor Emeritus at Boston College in Wilson, North Carolina, where he was Dean of the School of Humanities and the Elizabeth H. Jordan Chair of Southern Literature. His books include Notions, a Jim Clark Miscellany, two collections of poetry, Dancing on Canaan's Ruins and Handiwork, and he edited Fable in the Blood, the selected poems of Byron Herbert Reese. His work has appeared in the Georgia Review, Prairie Schooner, Southern Poetry Review, Denver Quarterly, Greensboro Review, and Asheville Poetry Review. He served as president of the South Atlantic Modern Language Association in 2015 and chair of the North Carolina Writers Conference in 2017. Jim Clark has released two solo CDs, Buried Land, Buried Land in the Service of Song, and three CDs with his band, The Near Myths. Next up, Mickey Dubrow will be speaking about Stella Suberman. Mickey Dubrow is the author of the novel American Judas and the upcoming novels, Sadie Dreams of Pony Island and Always Agnes. For more than 30 years, he wrote award-winning television promos, marketing presentations, and scripts for various clients, 
including Cartoon Network, TNT Latin America, HGTV, and CNN. He teaches classes on human writing and often addresses book clubs. Mickey Dubrow's personal essays and short stories have appeared in Prime Number Magazine, The Good Men Project, The Signal Mountain Review, Full Grown People, and Nick Sweeney's Internet Tendency. He is a contributor to the short story anthologies, Works in Progress and Supernatural Streets. Finally, we'll have Denton Loving, Denton Loving speaking about the poet George Addison Scarborough. Denton Loving's fiction, poetry, essays, and reviews have appeared in numerous publications, including the Kenyon Review, the Chattahoochee Review, the Three Penny Review, and Iron Horse Literary Review. He is the author of two collections of poetry, most recently TAMP, published by Mercer University Press. Follow him online at dentonloving.com. And um, participants, when um, as you enjoy these presentations, please um, load your feel free to load your questions using the Q&A button at the top or bottom of your Zoom screen. And when all three of our panelists are finished, then we will um, Get, um, entertain those questions, um, but feel free to load them as the presenters are speaking. And so I um, give to you first up, Jim Clark. Thanks, Melanie. Um, it's a special pleasure for me uh, as a native Tennessean to be part of, uh, of this panel. And I'll be talking on uh, Mildred Hahn. At the Revival Lost Southern Voices Festival in 2018, I presented on the Big Ballad Jamboree, Vanderbilt fugitive agrarian Donald Davidson's only novel, published posthumously in 1996. Davidson was the only one of the four major fugitive poets to remain at Vanderbilt University for his entire career. And during the 1930s, he taught and mentored several young Appalachian students and budding poets who made their way to Vanderbilt and who would soon become part of a remarkable first flowering of modern Appalachian literature. Jesse Stewart from Kentucky, James Still from Alabama, and Don West from Georgia. They had all graduated from Lincoln Memorial University in Harrogate, Tennessee in 1929. Add to their number Mildred Hahn, a young short story writer from East Tennessee, and the slightly older Robert Penn Warren back in Nashville after taking his degree at Oxford, and it begins to look like quite an extraordinary group. Last year, I presented here on North Georgia poet and social activist Don West. This year, I will focus on short story writer Mildred Hahn. Information on Hahn is scarce, and I'm indebted to the Tennessee Encyclopedia of History and Culture for the substance of this biography. Mildred Hahn was born in Hamblin County on January 6, 1911, to James Enzer and Margaret Ellen Hahn, but was raised in Hahn Hollow in the Hoodow district of Cock County. After graduation from high school in 1931, she attended Vanderbilt University, became interested in literature, and enrolled in John Crow Ransom's writing course. In this class, she used the songs and stories handed down through oral tradition in tales of her home and people. Encouraged by Ransom, Hahn continued to write stories after graduation while teaching high school in Franklin. In 1937, she completed an MA in English at Vanderbilt, studying under Ransom and Donald Davidson, both of whom signed her unpublished thesis, Hot County Ballads and Songs. The only collection of fiction published by Hahn, The Hawks Done Gone, 1940, includes several of the stories she had written in college. The themes of witchcraft, infanticide, incest, and miscegenation reveal a dark side of the author. But amid the talk of spirits and age-old prejudices is Hahn's use of dialect, mountain beliefs, and songs. The collection is not quite a novel, but more than a series of stories. Herschel Gower edited and published posthumously 10 additional stories by Hahn in 1968, uh, The Hawks Done Gone and Other Stories, and this is The Hawks Done Gone and Other Stories. And I'll just add, uh, parenthetically, Gower was one of my Southern literature professors at Vanderbilt when I was an undergraduate there in the mid-1970s. From 1942 to 1943, Hahn served as book editor for the Nashville Tennessean 
and later as an editorial assistant to Alan Tate on the Sewanee Review, 1944 through 46. From 1950 to 1963, Hahn worked as an editor and information specialist for the Arnold Engineering Development Center in Tullahoma, writing speeches, news releases, and correspondence courses for military personnel. Hahn died on December 20th, 1966 in Washington, D.C., and is buried in Morristown, Tennessee, next to her mother in the Hahn family plot. The Hawks Done Gone and Other Stories was widely praised. Alan Tate called it, quote, a very important book, while Andrew Lytle observed, Mildred Hahn has the true sense of a certain people removed from a so-called more advanced kind of society. Donald Davidson situates Hahn well within the context of Appalachian culture and society and speaks to the pleasures afforded by the stories. Nothing exactly like it has ever appeared in American literature. Perhaps it is a fair description to say that it resembles old ballads done in a prose medium. It has the same compound of somber tragedy, rollicking humor, and feeling for the strange and unusual. J.T. Skerritt, reviewing the book in Volume 2, Number 6 of Folklore Forum, writes, Certain qualities must be granted to this volume of stories without grudge. They are fresh and strong in subject matter. They are remarkable. This is no book of backwoods whimsy. Miss Hahn was concerned with the dark corners of the human psyche, and she bore a relentless candle. The stories as a body make up an interesting sort of cycle. Miss Hahn's narrator is Mary Dorthula White, the granny woman of, of Cock County, Tennessee, in whose mind's eye the history and interactions of people of the district is composed. Bruce A. Rosenberg, writing in volume 23, number two of the Georgia Review, asserts, this haunting book is destined for a peculiar fame, perhaps even beyond what its artistry merits. Those who read for pleasure will be touched, but with academics, the short stories of Mildred Hahn may never be bestsellers, though they are of such a nature that future students of American writing, especially of the writing of the South, will want to account for them. The voice of the Hawks Done Gone creates a tradition of its own, somewhat away from the main current of American fiction, and will probably not alter or divert that current appreciably, but deserves our attention nevertheless. Attention is indeed being given to Hahn and her stories today via the excellent Mildred Hahn Conference at Walters State Community College in Morristown, Tennessee, which began in 2010, and the associated Mildred Hahn Review. In the story, Barsha's horse he made, it flew. Barsha Knight, the lazy, imperious, narcissistic stepson of the narrator, Mary Dorthula White, who is also a talented woodworker and folk artist, crafts a life-size flying mechanical horse to fly him to heaven because he is, quote, so tired, so very tired a common refrain he repeats over and over throughout his life, especially any time anyone asked him to do a bit of work. Another repetitive, almost hypnotic element of the story is that Barsha has a physical tick that causes his right foot to jump up and down constantly. It never stops, and it drives Mary Dorthula to distraction. Mary Dorthula and her young daughter, Amy, do most of the work for Barsha's projects, following his directions, sometimes aided by Keely, a witchy granny woman neighbor who helped with Barsha's difficult birth years ago and seems to have a special affinity for him, often stopping by to cut his red hair, some of which Mary Dorthula notices she sneaks into her apron. From Dona, another older female neighbor, Mary Dorthula learns more about Keely's witchy ways and also that Keeley nurses a grudge against Barsha for riding the old the mare Old Maud so hard and long she collapsed and died. Barsha's biological mother, Marthy, who died long ago, loved Old Maud and had her skinned after she died, hanging her hide in the barn. Barsha uses Old Maud's hide to stretch over the frame of his flying horse. Amy pays a visit to Teeley while Barsha is working on his horse 
and while there notices that the little wooden horse Barsha had recently whittled for Keeley at her request is lying on the floor with a little beeswax effigy of a man attached to it. The effigy's head, sporting a strand of Barsha's red hair, is broken off and lying beside it, and a thorn is stuck through the effigy's right foot. She tells Mary Dorthula this. Mary Dorthula and Amy finish the horse, which is mounted on top of the fruit drying kiln behind the house. Sunday evening, Barsha decides it is time for him to go. He slowly climbs up on the horse and starts working the pedal, which causes the wings to flap. Mary Dorthula and Amy believe they witness the horse begin to lift off, but just as quickly it comes crashing down. I'll read the last few paragraphs of the story to give you a sense uh, of, uh, of Paul's wonderful style. Amy went twirling around like a leaf in a whirlwind. I did too. We got to him. He was laying there with his head all bent down under his chest. Old Maud's was too. The sticks in her neck were broke. I didn't look at Barsha's head so much. I looked at his foot. He ain't kilt, I said. We untied him from old Maud, him and old Maud. Barsha was heavy. You know how fat he was. I couldn't tote him in. He didn't say a word, not air a word, he didn't. Amy helped all she could and we managed to drag him to the house and got him in. I didn't listen to see if he was breathing. I watched that foot up and down, just like old Maud, I thought. We stretched him out on the bed. I saw his neck was limber, limber as a dish clout. I'll splinter it up, I said. But something told me that wasn't any use. Not in that, not in that. I took a hold of his neck and watched his foot. Always that. His head rolled over a little. He looked at me. I won't be so tired. So tired, he said, keeping time. I stood and watched him like one dog watching another die. He laid there like common, stone still, save for that foot. Then it stopped. Amy, only a secondary character in, uh, in this story and quite young, is the central character of the next story in the collection, The Spring is Trusty. In this story, Amy is now 25 and to her father's consternation, unmarried. She has no interest in either Enzer or Eloyd, her only two potential suitors, and the story begins with her carefree singing of a verse of the old square dance tune, Weevily Wheat. The single life is the happy life. The single life is jolly. I am single and no man's wife. No man shall control me. Uh, and uh, I will try <laughs> to offer you a rendition on the banjo uh, of that old song, uh, uh, Weevily Wheat. <laughs> Charlie, he's a fine young man. Charlie, he's a dandy. Charlie, he's a fine young man. He's the girl all candy. The single life is a happy life. The single life is jolly. I am single and no man's wife. No man shall control me. Charlie, he's a fine young man. Charlie, he's a dandy. Charlie, he's a fine young man. He's a girl gone candy. Don't want none of your weevily wheat. Don't want none of your barley. I want some of your best old flour to bake a cake for Charlie. Charlie, he's a fine young man. Charlie, he's a dandy. Charlie, he's a fine young man. He's the girl on candy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Higher up the cherry tree, the rapper grow the cherry. The more you hug and kiss the girl, the sooner they will marry. Charlie, he's a fine young man. Charlie, he's a dandy. Charlie, he's a fine young man. The girls on candy. Take her by the lily white hand, lead her like a pigeon, make her dance the weasley wheat, scatter her religion. Charlie, he's a fine young man. Charlie, he's a dandy. Charlie, he's a fine young man. The girls on candy. And now back to our moderator, Melly. Hi, thank you so much for that. Um, I, uh, and you know, I, I can certainly attest to the power of, of how that ballad um, plays out in, in that particular short story, um, which does, uh, you know, not have a particular, particularly happy ending and I, and I love that about the old ballads too and I know those were um, part of what Mildred Hahn did too uh um she was a ballad singer and um yeah I would encourage anyone to to, re to read her book of short stories if if you they appreciate the short form um that song certainly informs the rest of that story and thank you so much for for that for that um for that that talk it, it certainly gives Mildred Han, um, some great attention. Um, next up, we have Mickey Dubrow, who will speak about um, memoirist Stella Superman. Thank you, Jim, that was great. Always love to hear you uh, play for us. Um, let me begin by saying shalom, y'all. In 1920, Union City, Tennessee had a population of a little over 5,300. 5, Five of them were Jews. Morris and Rebecca Kaufman and their three children, Will, Mina, and Ruth. In 1922, the number of Jews went up to six with the birth of Stella Kaufman. That number remained until 1933, at which time the Kaufmans left Union City and the number of Jews fell to zero. Don't worry, more Jews came to Union City later on. In 1995, at the age of 73, Stella, now Stella Superman, went back to Union City to do research for her memoir, The Jew Store, a Family Memoir. She would go on to write two more memoirs, When It Was Our War, A Soldier's Wife on the Home Front, and The G.I. Bill Boys, a memoir. But she's mainly known for The Jew Store. It was adapted into a musical, and the film rights were purchased by Dolly Parton. The Jew Store was published in 1998 by Algonquin Books of Chapel Hill and covers the 13 years the Kaufmans lived in Union City. It's not a traditional memoir. Superman changed the name of the city to Concordia, the names of her parents to Aaron and Reba Bronson, and the names of her siblings to Joey and Miriam. Superman's sister is not in the memoir though Superman calls herself Stella Ruth. I was not able to find out why Superman decided not to include her sister, though I have a theory. I believe Superman was trying to reduce the number of characters in the book and Ruth was the easiest to, to leave out. Either that or Stella just really didn't like Ruth. Superman once said she saw the best and worst of America. She was referring to her experience during World War II as a Jewish soldier's life, living on an Air Force base, but she could have been talking about the Jew story. The memoir tells the story of Aaron Bronson taking his family from New York City to rural Tennessee to open a dry goods store that sold work clothes, school clothes, sheets, towels, yard goods, and notions 
called Bronson's Low Price Store, though everyone in town refers to it as the Jew Store. Though told from Superman's point of view, Aaron is the hero of the story, a Jew born into poverty in pre-revolutionary Russia who comes to America, finds a wife, and finds his fortune in a place where people are shocked to learn that Jews don't have horns. Aaron is a natural salesman who treats everyone around him with decency and respect. His philosophy of life is stated in the memoir's epigraph. For a real bargain, while you're making a living, you should also make a life. The Bronsons do make a life in Concordia and encounter the best and worst of America. The best is epitomized by their landlord, Miss Brookie Simmons, who treats the Bronsons more like extended family than tenants. The worst is Miss Brookie's cousin, Tom Dillon, who hates Yankees and Jews, and especially Yankee Jews from New York. He makes this clear when he tells Aaron, a Yankee Jew merchant comes and turns First Street into a cutthroat place, and pretty soon everybody in town is miserable. As Concordia's leading property owner, Tom tries in vain to stop Aaron from renting space in his store. I'd like to read a little bit from the story that also shows some of the difficulties they ran into. It's a, a church service or it's an outdoor event and it's all going very nicely. The preacher moved to the back of the platform and from the grounds, some kind of group all in white moved toward it. A play, my mother wondered, but what kind of play was this? With everybody in the same cost costumes and pointy hats down over their faces, with just a couple of eye holes. She nudged Miss Brookie. That bunch, Miss Brookie expelled, foot. A word whose spelling is unknown to me, but for expressing vexation, I favored Miss Brookie's and all of Concordians. And shot them a glance that could curdle milk, as Miss Brookie herself would have said, the bedsheet brigade, she muttered to my mother. There were about 30 bedsheets in all, my father knew exactly who they were. They were the Ku Klux Klan. He had heard about them in Nashville, where there was talk that these Negro-hating, Jew-hating, Catholic-hating groups were coming back to life after a long period of dormancy. When my father had heard the talk, he had taken only a little notice, vaguely picturing them as operating in some faraway place, somewhere way out in the country. Uh-oh, he suddenly thought, wasn't he now in that faraway place and that somewhere way out in the country? He studied this curious bunch. Why the disguises? E even the Cossacks didn't wear disguises. Ku Kluxers, in order to inspire fear, had to operate differently from Cossacks. Cossacks only had to be Cossacks to intimidate. They were tough soldiers who lived in barracks. Kluxers, being the guys next door, had to don sheets with eye holes to transport the little man who delivered your milk into something that could scare somebody. Jews have been in the American South since the 1700s. Many of them were from Britain. One of the most famous or infamous, depending on your opinion of the lost cause, was Judah P. Benjamin, who served the Confederate States first as Attorney General, then as Secretary of War, and finally as Secretary of State. However, most of the Jews in the South today are descendants of the Ashkenazi Jews who migrated to America between 1820 and 1924 from Germany and Eastern Europe. Though most settled in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and Chicago, many were peddlers who traveled from town to town on a horse-drawn wagon. These are the Jews who settled in rural towns around the country, including the American South. The common joke was that they put down roots wherever the horse died. And after the horse was buried, they opened a juice store. Like Stella Superman, I'm Southern by birth and Jewish by the grace of God. And like Superman, my family owned and operated a juice store, though this was before I was born. In 1912, my paternal grandfather, Paul Dubro, came to America from Russia. He settled in Chattanooga, Tennessee, because he had cousins who lived there who told him it was a nice place to live. He eventually opened a grocery store in the neighborhood and a neighborhood known back then as Blue Goose Hollow. 
1894, the blues singer Bessie Smith was born in Blue Goose Hollow. My grandmother, Frida, was Orthodox and didn't work on the Sabbath, which for Jews is Saturday. However, the grocery store was to survive. Paul had to work Saturdays because that was when his predominantly Gentile customers did their shopping. Paul and Frida lived behind the store. On Saturdays, Frida would sit in the kitchen and watch Paul running around serving customers. Then one Saturday, she started working too. He asked her what she was doing. She didn't have to work on the Shabbos. Frida said Paul was her husband and she wanted to help. The Jews who immigrated to America had to balance the need to fit in with the desire to maintain their identity and traditions. Though Paul and Frida had to work on Shabbos, they were fortunate because there was a good sized Jewish community in Chattanooga at that time. There were synagogues and Jewish social groups. In the Jew store, the Bronson family is the Jewish community. The closest synagogue is miles away. This isn't a problem for Aaron. He is what we would refer to today as a cultural Jew. But Reba is closer to her faith. She wants her children to be Jewish. When Joey is old enough to have a bar mitzvah, she knows that isn't going to happen in Concordia. She and Aaron decide to send Joey to live with relatives in New York for a year. When Joey returns, his little sister Stella barely remembers him. And he feels like in Concordia, um, he feels like life in Concordia is boring after living in New York. He eventually goes to live in New York and only fit, visits the family for holidays. Meanwhile, in Concordia, Miriam and Stella have become secularized and influenced by the non-Jewish community. When Reba's Aunt Sadie comes to visit, the children put on a show for her. Miriam does a dance and Stella sings a song. Stella, insta insta uh, Stella innocently chooses a song she learned in school and can't understand why Aunt Sadie is shocked when she hears her sing, oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. A lack of a nearby synagogue for Joey's bar mitzvah and Stella's bad song choices are nothing compared to what becomes the biggest threat of assimilation to the Bronson family. When Marion becomes old enough to start dating, there are no nice Jewish boys around. Instead, she falls in love with a Christian boy. Aaron and Reba don't want their daughter to marry a Gentile. So Aaron sells Bronson's low price store and the family moves to New York and then to Miami Beach, cities with large Jewish communities. What's most interesting to me about their decision is that it's not anti-Semitism that drives the Bronsons from Concordia, but social acceptance. Maintaining cultural and religious identity is an ongoing struggle, not just for Jews, but for many immigrants. Miriam does eventually marry a Jewish man. Most of the Jew stores in the rural South no longer exist, but not because of the threat of mixed marriages. The Jews who migrated from Eastern Europe had little to no education. Once they became successful merchants, they made sure their children got a good education and attended college. In the 1970s, their college-educated offspring moved to larger cities like Atlanta and Nashville for better economic opportunities. With no one to take over, the rural Jew stores died with the parents, but not before they left their mark on the South, and the South left its mark on the Jews. Southern Jews recite Hebrew prayers in synagogue with a Southern accent. For breakfast, they'll have a bagel with cream cheese, and a side of grits. Few Southern Jews actually say, Shalom y'all, but many have the combination Southern and Jewish greeting hanging on the wall in their houses. In between leaving Union City and writing her memoir, Stella Superman had many interesting life experiences. While living in Miami Beach, Florida, Al Capone's son was in her class and he came to school with his own bodyguards. In 1939, the St. Louis sailed from Germany to Cuba with 937 passengers, most of them German Jews seeking refugee asylum from Nazi Germany. Both Cuba and the United States refused to accept them. 
Eventually, the boat had to go back to Germany, where most of the passengers died in the Holocaust. When the boat circled the Florida coast, Superman and her friends waved at the doomed Jews on board. Stella Superman married Jack Superman on January 31st, 1942. They had one son, Rick Ian. When the Supermans moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, Stella was press secretary for North Carolina Art Museum. She wrote her memoir at 73 and her last memoir when she was 90, which should give hope to anyone who feels like they're too old to start a writing career. Stella Superman died on October 6, 2017 at the age of 95. For obituary stakes, she died instantly and without pain from a longstanding but asystematic heart condition. And then the obituary says a very Jewish thing. It says, we should all be so lucky. Thank you. And back to uh, Melanie. Thank you. I was riveted throughout all that. It went every part of it. Um, and thank you for bringing in your personal experience. That was wonderful. Um, I um, I would I would love to read her memoir, and it, it's fascinating to know that she was you know with us as recently as as she was. Fi um, our final panelist today is um, Denton Loving, and he will be uh, offering his take on the poet George Addison Scarborough. Denton. Thank you, Melanie. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. And I also want to thank Gina and Allie and the Georgia Center for the Book. I also especially want to thank Anna Schrackner, who was involved in bringing me into today's event. So thank you, Anna. My interest in George Scarborough's work, particularly his poetry, began because of our shared association with Lincoln Memorial University in Harrogate, Tennessee. LMU was one of several schools that Scarborough attended. Unfortunately, his experience at LMU was not the most fulfilling and he wrote that he felt his education there was comparable to a glorified high school. He didn't seem to speak very highly of any of the schools that he attended. However, he did earn his BA degree from LMU in 1947. I graduated from LMU 49 years later. And after I was a student there, I worked for many years in the Division of University Advancement, where I had the chance to meet Mr. Scarborough a handful of times. Although Scarborough's writings had been respected by LMU, most notably with the award of the honorary doctorate in 2005, his work has often been overshadowed by three of LMU's other graduates. Um, and I was pleased to hear Jim mention those in his work, James Still, Jesse Stewart, and Don West. They were all graduates of the class of 1929, quite a bit earlier than when George Scarborough attended, um, but they're also widely considered among the most recognizable forefathers of Appalachian literature. Over 70 years, George Scarborough published seven books, including one novel. He wrote hundreds of poems that were published widely, including in the best magazines and journals. I am by no means an expert on Scarborough's work or his life, but I am an admirer. I'd like to highlight a few of the poems that I love most, um, and that's probably because I identify with some of these poems, but also some of these poems all touch on recurring themes of his work. Some of the biographical information, as well as some of the literary insights I'm sharing today are informed by Randy Mackin's excellent book, George Scarborough, Appalachian Poet. The book is subtitled, A Biographical and Literary Study with Unpublished Writings. And it's a really wonderful resource and guide to better understanding Scarborough as a person, as well as his work. Randy Mackin's original interest in Scarborough came through Malcolm Glass, a poet and professor at Austin Peay State University. Glass had recommended Scarborough's poetry to Mackin for further research, noting that Scarborough's writing was deeply rooted in Southeastern Tennessee geography and her people. Scarborough himself confirmed that in a 1994 letter to Mackin where he wrote, my writing matter has been family, place, and the establishment of those I've loved as family in habitation and with a name. Scarborough was born in 1915 in Polk County, Tennessee, the most Southeastern county in the state. Georgia lies to the south and North Carolina to the east. Most of the terrain of Polk County is mountainous, and these mountains prove constant in Scarborough's work, life and work, just as they do to many of us who live and work in this region. 
two rivers, the Hawassi and the Ocoee, flow through Polk County, and both rivers would also become of great importance in Scarborough's poetry. He often referred to this land as the East Anel. So let's look at the poem Evening, which is, was included in Scarborough's first collection, Teleco Blue. Uh, I hope this poem will give a better indication of how Scarborough wrote about place. Evening, a while at most, and I shall be, excuse me, I'm sorry, a while at most, and I shall be following quietness into these hills, walking up these valleys under beloved leprous trees, where locusts plague the heart and blue water sounds over the eerie crying. Eternally dismissed, I shall become only a name under the known cover of this earth of blue mountains and unintelligible rivers. This stark, beautiful land requires no record, is separately indexed under the stones slouching brilliantly on the East Enel Hills, looming grayly in the sunless evening on the spur of hills that grow anonymous when the red leaves rule the valley. And first and last are confluent into one new knowledge covered with an ancient fact, so time is lost with every generation. And Reuben sleeps as soundly as his sire. Too much of me is now in every place among these uplands where the dazzling stones lean in the red and yellow shadow and more prepared to die tomorrow and the day after. For in these hills are lost the faces counted friend and beautiful. Like foxes invisible to the day, they rise and run my heart in every darkness between the rivers of the, of the county world. Considering these, considering these, loneliness is tossed upon me like a bouquet out of the evening. Lostness is like a flower rooted in the orange-red sundown, a flower I cannot deal with in usual ways and pin it with my compliments upon the shoulder of a friend. This poem is typical of Scarborough's focus on place, which should not be thought of as the same thing as setting or location. Place-based writing certainly includes landscape, but also relies heavily on the relationship between the place and the people who occupy it. Mackin says that it is impossible to read Scarborough's poetry or fiction without noticing the important role landscape plays in the writing. But Mackin also says that Scarborough was not a poet of place, but was the place about which he wrote. Bill Brown, a noted poet and teacher from Tennessee who knew Scarborough for many years said, his topography is a splendor with the county landscapes and people of the Tennessee mountains and the small sharecropper cabins in which he spent his childhood. However, Rodney Jones, in his 1999 introduction to the republication of Teleco Blue, said that Scarborough's early work was of such precise focus that it does not seem to represent any place so large as a region. Its emphasis, emphasis is on the natural order more than the aesthetic landscape. I personally am not sure what distinctions should be made between these statements. One might argue that the best poets who write about their specific place are intimately connected and tied to that place in a way that is difficult to separate from their work. Another argument is that no place-based writing can possibly represent an entire region. After all, Appalachia is not a monolith. Robert Cumming, who published a number of Scarborough's books through Iris Press, has been quoted as calling Scarborough a consummate author of place. But Will, researcher William Rappy Moore also accurately observes that Scarborough also depicted his homeland as a mental construct, as, as much as a physical place. This complicated relationship to place, as well as the complicated way Scarborough incorporated place into his work, are some of the reasons that I relate to and admire his poetry. I'm also deeply interested in the poems Scarborough wrote about his family, and especially those written about his father. My most recent book of poems, Tamp, is very much about my own father and the father-son paradigm. Scarborough's second book of poems, The Course is Upward, was published a year after his own father's death. The book is dedicated to his father, and Mackin says the first five poems are sincere efforts to come to grips with that death and to deal with the void left behind as the son considers what the man meant to him. Let's take a look at one of the poems from The Course is Upward. This is, death is a short word. Like a sparrow sitting in a wide walk, I myself grew small and precise inside, 
in exact proportion to how much he died, and it was thus it affected my talk. For if he sank and wrestled in a sound, I said immaculately thrifty words, the beautiful, vowed speeches of birds that love short sound. As if in the projection of clean speech, the bright, impossible face of death was set backward by my careful breath, him I retrieved, restored. But let him reach pertness, but let him reach pertness again, be lively, learn to smile in some way I remembered, order died, and my amazing tongue became untied, and roar arose and lingered for a while, till he subsided into pale and pallid, closing his shining eyes. Then I perceived the catastrophic tongue again believed, only the monosyllable finally valid. Worth noting is how this poem equates death with language. The speaker's words are reduced in exact proportion to how much the father died, devolving a both tone and substance till only the monosyllable is finally valid. I already mentioned that death is a short word is a poem where Scarborough seems to be processing his father's passing. It's important to know that Scarborough's relationship with his father was strained throughout their lives. According to Mackin, this and other poems in this series were written immediately following the father's death, and they lack some of the bitterness that is evident in mid-career and later poetry. William Wright B. Moore says, examination of Scarborough's poetry benefits from an understanding of his complex and often estranged relationship with his family and the denizens of his region, which contextualizes the outsider perspective of his poetry. Scarborough experienced both belonging and estrangement, not only from the Polk County country of his birth, but also from the family. Scarborough's poetry embraces the paradox of simultaneous affection and discord. It is likely that much of the contention between Scarborough and his father emanated from the fact that Scarborough was gay. However, Scarborough rarely discussed his sexuality in his work and seemed not to think of himself as a queer writer in any way that that label might have been applied during his lifetime. I believe it was only in his last book, Under the Lemon Tree, that any of his poems touch on his sexuality at all. Scarborough did, however, often discuss and sometimes write about his own obsession with words and language, and it was no secret that he would rather be somewhere reading a book than learning to be a good farmer. Apparently, this alone provided enough fodder for the two men to rarely, if ever, see eye to eye, and it seems, too, that Scarborough spent a lifetime working this out in his poetry. This painful relationship seemed to haunt Scarborough, with pieces of it rising in various poems. I would refer readers to poems such as Impasse, where the narrator encounters fear of the father even after the father's death, and to Leathers that recounts a whipping from a razor strap wearing father who is honing his child to a fine edge. The poem Daddy You Bastard focuses on the enduring love-hate aspect of their father-son relationship. And another whipping is recounted in the poem The Christmas Dance, where I, and I won't uh, share this entire poem, but I wanna share an excerpt this is where Scarborough remembers, he wailed me until I pissed my pants because I tarried with a terrapin and would not scythe briars. He stoked me with an elder bough, foamy with flowers. My hot leg reached my foot. I walked in my own warm rain, but God, my father, or whoever was up there bending above me with white lightning in his hand, those flying petals were right for me in the blue April wind. I groaned with renewed realness as they fell. It was apparent that the two men never fully understood each other, especially where the idea of work was concerned. Um, this, uh, there, Scarborough recorded an early incident in his journal where he told his father that he would one day go to college, and his father said to him, you're going to the poorhouse if you don't learn more about your family, more about farming than you know now. This opposing idea of work was revisited in many of Scarborough's biographies and interviews, and especially in his poems. Because we have so little time, I want to next share a later poem that seems to encompass this subject. This poem is from Under the Lemon Tree, Scarborough's final collection that was published by Iris Press after his death. In these poems, Scarborough assumes the voice and alter ego of Han Shan, the legendary 8th century Chinese poet, 
And I would be remiss not to include at least one Han Shan poem in this presentation, in part because the poems are just really beautiful, but also in part because Scarborough found a voice and even a sense of an alter ego in Han Shan. And I'm sure that alter ego was what allowed him to feel that he could touch on sexuality in any way. So this poem is from Under the Lemon Tree is Predestination. All things come to little in this overestimated world, his mother declares, mixing breakfast batter. But one thing be denied, be he man or be he beast, he who will dine must work. Listening to her same song, Han Shan plates and unplates his unemployed fingers, impatient with the slow plop of the great spoon turning in the honeyed bowl and telling himself, as he always does, that he must take a trade. But what trade will he take, or better, what trade will take him? Inept at weaving, too short-sighted for embroidery and other cottage industry, awkward even at combing his own hair, he is unable to beat the air without breaking his arm, his father says. Given the football, he runs the wrong way and scores for the other team. Plowing is past his power, wood chopping impossible. What then will he do, paint lady fingers at festivals? Between their altercations, sell rice cakes to lawyers on circuit day, hunt through the trees for dainties to please a merchant's palate, grabble for ground nuts, truckle or truffles, drive dilatory geese to market, net butterflies for sedentary lepidopterists, count skylarks in season for bearded statisticians. Opportunities seem endless. But I'll not work at any of these things, he mutters to himself, his mouth watering hearing the great spoon scrape the side of the breakfast bowl. I'd rather make a wooden beak and peck dung with the chickens. I was meant to be a poet, and a poet I will be. Tuning flutes at festivals, leading dances at celebrations, being acclaimed for my elegant bon mots and delectable phrases, measuring iams, not shoes for distance rickshaw runners. And I'll be doubly damned if I catch pennies at toll gates to build another highway even if I do grow spatulate thumbs from sopping sweet platters in my dear mother's kitchen while waiting for the dumbass editor of the Rump County News to say that a good time was had by all who came to the party and print my matchless haiku among the want ads of this weekly edition. George uh, Scarborough's friend, Ed Francisco, wrote that George Scarborough lamented for much of his life the lack of critical attention his work received. Certainly, Scarborough never garnered the recognition of the poets who endorsed his books, luminaries such as Alan Tate, Andrew Little, and James Dickey. One reason for his omission from this elite cadre was his failure to embrace modernism and its attendant free verse experiments. Scarborough complained about being self-taught early in his career, and it's accurate to say that he wrote almost exclusively in traditional forms. Only with the publication of Invita Invitation to Kim in 1989 and its subsequent nomination for the Pulitzer Prize in 1990 do we witness a stylistic transformation characterized by innovation and eclecticism. I mentioned before that I had had an opportunity to meet George Scarborough a handful of times. Although he didn't place a lot of value on his education from Lincoln Memorial University, he sometimes participated in alumni activities, and he lived much of his life in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which is only about an hour and a half from the Harrogate campus. In Oak Ridge, there has always been an active LMU alumni chapter, and it seemed evident to me that Mr. Scarborough had maintained relationships with other graduates who lived nearby. I was also present in 2005 when LMU awarded him the honorary doctorate of letters, and I remember him being very frail, but also very pleased to be recognized and honored by the university. I regret all of the opportunities that I had to talk to Mr. Scarborough about his work and the work of poetry in general. My excuses are that I was young and somewhat shy, and I had not found my own way to writing my own poetry, and I didn't know enough about him or his work to know to speak to him about those topics but I certainly wish that I could go back again. And that's one reason I'm so grateful to be able to talk about him today and to think about the way that we might move forward in reclaiming lost voices such as his. So I will um, attempt to stop sharing my screen now and turn it back over to Melanie.
Thank you, Denton. That 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 was wonderful. Um, it's definitely uh, enriching to 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 see and hear the work of of such a poet, and um, per particularly with the the last um, poem that you that you read, I um, I you know I certainly it, uh, all those topics, the family dynamic, um, the wondering about one's career path are you know, infinitely relatable and um, lasting. And um, I also really appreciate the deep wit that was in that poem. And I'm sure his other other poetry, uh, something one doesn't often encounter and um, so that certainly seems to be part of his legacy. Thank you um, to all three of our presenters, um, Jim Clark, Mickey Dubrow and, and Denton Loving. And now it's time for, um, to if everyone can, um, come back uh, to to address some of the questions that might have been left in the chat in the Q and A. I did I put a couple of things myself in the in the chat because for some reason I couldn't access my Q and A. But um, I guess first I'll go to the Q and A and see uh, what's here from uh, from Jessica Handler. A question for Mickey: Did the Subermans ever find themselves confronted by the Klan? Oh, and then she said, "Well, that just got answered." So, um, so I, that that was addressed in, in your uh, in your in your talk. Do you want to say anything more about that? Um, it, it's actually a big part of the story, and I, I don't want to tell what it is because it's kind of the big reveal is that um, they do have a very dangerous, up close and personal experience with the Ku Klux Klan that Stella claims she, her parents never knew about. Is this in in one or both of the memoirs? It's in the Jew store. It's it's kind of the the big moment in the Jew store, the big oh scary goodness. moment. It's kind of like if you're reading To Kill a Mockingbird. It's <laughs> kind of like when uh, when when Jim, you know, when Jim and, and Scout are attacked after the uh, Halloween, and she's stuck after in the, the ham costume. Right, exactly. It's it's almost you know exactly like well not exactly but it's similar in feeling to that. And um. A good reason, among many others, of course, to 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 actually read the memoir is are the are both memoirs uh, fairly accessible in print? Yes. Oh, there, there there's three of them, and they're all they're all. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, from Don Donna Little, um, for for Denton, how do you see Scarborough's evolution as a poet from Telco Blue to Under the Lemon Tree? You know, um, as I said before, I'm by no means an expert, but I, I would say that I think that the later poems in Under the Lemon Tree uh, benefit from a little less formality. And as I mentioned before, I think that it must have, it feels that it was very uh, freeing for him in moments that he could allow Han Shan to speak for him in ways that he perhaps did not feel uh, he could speak for himself in earlier works. Um, I think Han Shan was probably a very useful tool for him later in life to be able to give voice to some thoughts and feelings that uh, perhaps he felt slightly more restrained. It's hard to say that uh, definitively when he has poems like Daddy, You Bastard, um, but uh, he definitely, I think, under the lemon tree, uh, he must have felt a great uh, a sense of stronger freedom almost like fiction writers use a character instead of you know the i in that might be useful. i think that's i think that's exactly right thank you um let me see what else I'm, i'll go to the chat and um i'm sorry i'll go to the q a now um nope i'm i mean back to the chat <laughs> i'm having trouble um Okay. Uh, okay. There, it looks like more people have entered here. Um, oh, here, here's my question. Um, I, uh, ha I'm almost um, right now. I'm actually reading. So this is for Jim. This I'm reading Mildred Hans, The Hawks Done Gone, and um, I, you know, there's uh, certainly taken whole. Uh, it just occurred to me uh, that, that you know Mary Dorfula, who's um, most of the story cycles um, characters are being told from her point of view but her her, her you know, the, the the her most famous story with Barsha who's certainly an unforgettable character and then the story after that with 
that um, where Amy is sort of toggling between the two suitors, one who seems to be sweet talking her and one who's uh, manipulating her into uh, you know, going with him, but it's sort of the end, not one is better than the other. And then, um, it, you know, it seems to, it, it seems like in, in some cases that, uh, that uh, Mildred Hahn is almost, it, it, but uh, I'm just saying the men don't come come off too well in the end and, and all the all the character studies are fascinating and I just wondered what you thought about her psychology into you know, romance marriage um if anything was coming from her personal experience because you know so, while some of these characters are overtly bad uh, others uh, Barsha is just one of those who we're not quite sure where he's coming from but certainly she uh does spend a lot of time um delving into the psychology of her male characters and I wondered if you uh, what you thought about that uh, yeah, yeah. I, well, it's fascinating to me. And uh, like I say, there's so little uh, biographical information about um, Han available. I mean, it, she was never married. Um, I, you know, so I don't know much about how much autobiography might have found its way into her uh, depictions of male female sure. relationships. Yeah. But uh, it, it's just, all so many of the stories are so fatalistic especially i mean you know women women just have a, a really hard road to hoe in mildred Hahn's stories yeah uh, and it's because of the men you know i mean uh, yeah but but she does explore those bad men and their faults and flaws and failings uh, under the microscope the story with amy i think um is knowing that she should will have an easier life going with, and I can't, I can't, their names are escaping me. I know they both start with an E, uh -huh. um, the, the, but then the irresistible lure of the, the other one, that's just, um, it's genius really. Um, and let me see, what else do we have here? So thank you for introducing me to George Scarborough Ditton, I agree. Um, so we have some links here um, that, the, um, that have been posted, uh, um, um, Everyone who's uh, reading now can um, can link on. There's Denton Loving's Tamp. It shows my book, American Judas by Mickey Dubro, The Juice Store, a family memoir by Stella Superman. And but yes, that's um, when it was our war, a soldier's wife on the home front by Stella Superman and her and her third memoir, American Judas. Um, and I had a question about uh, oh, just a comment. Um, that was oh. Actually, oh great! Uh, here's some more some more questions that are coming up. I, I had a quick comment that the first uh, poems that Denton was reading of Scarborough's reminded me a little bit of Ted Hughes's early poetry. Um, but um, you know that I'm not sure how fair that comparison is. Um, okay, so from Pearl McKinney, um, thank you, Mickey, Jim, and Denton. Great to see you. And I can also recommend the work of Mary Ward Brown, an Alabama Jewish short story writer, Tongues of Flame and American Judas, which was ahead of its time, she says. And we can um, entertain more questions at this time. Uh, if anybody wants to, I'll go back to the, the chat and then back to the Q&A, which I think, um, I think that's all for now. Um, certainly it, it would behoove everyone to check out the links that have been posted and uh, learn more about the great, uh, very deserving work of these uh, three wonderful writers, and I and thank our our scholars for presenting. And um, I hope. It, oh, did some maybe something more came up? Oh, can we have another song by James Clark from Jim Clark? Asks Pam Campbell. So I think uh, we have time for that. We do. We have till four fifteen. So certainly, um, we need to make time. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Oh wow! Um, would you? Would you? Would you care to oblige us? <laughs> um, well, I, I, I did want to uh, mention to Denton uh, when, when you were talking about um, Scarborough's attitude toward LMU or his estimation of it. Uh, he, he didn't like any of the schools that he went to. And maybe you know that he said basically the same nasty things about UT and Iowa. And uh, <laughs> so I, I, he was just an, an unhappy student, I think. I was I was really interested in the session yesterday uh, where Donna mentioned that uh, 
Scarborough may have been on the spectrum. That was information that I had never heard before. Uh -huh. And I'm also uh, uh, would point out that he was always he ha he always had to skip time between going from one school to another. So by the time that he graduated from LMU, he was quite older. Um, so I'm sure that might be one reason that he always felt a little bit uh, above the education that he was looking for. Yeah, I think so. Uh, well, um, I've certainly, the banjo is not my primary instrument and I hadn't really planned to do anything else, but uh, maybe I'll try to do a little bit of Shady Grove. Great, oh, that'll be wonderful. Shady grow my little girl, shady grow my face, shady grow my little girl, I love you away. Went to see my shady girl standing in the door, shoes and stockings in her hand. Little bare feet on the floor, shady grove, my little love, shady grove, I sang, shady grove, my little love. Pulls in the summertime, touches in the fall. If I can't get the girl I love, I won't have none at all. Oh, Shady Grove, my little love. Shady Grove, I say. Shady Grove, my little love. Oh, no. Sixteen miles of mountain road, twenty miles of sand. Never me travel this road again. I'll be a married man. Shady grove, my little love. Shady grove, I say. Shady grove, my little love. Should have practiced that a little. <laughs> Thank you so much. Always a great song to hear. Is that claw, is that claw hammer style? Uh, no, I, I I would love to be able to play uh, claw hammer banjo, but I, what I've done in my banjo playing is just adapted my folk guitar strumming to the banjo. So it's, it doesn't really have a name. It's just a hybrid thing. <laughs> uh. Well, that's the best kind. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, thank you, everyone, um, for being here. Um, we can take a, a couple last questions. Um, I had a couple comments here. Um, what, what a wonderful way to be in the world. Good readings and discussion and good singing and banjo playing. Thanks to all of you. Yes, thank you so much for, for, for enhancing um, the, the talks with music that, that really sets the atmosphere. I thank everyone for being here and um, Jim Clark, Mickey Dubrow and Denton Loving. Thank you, Gina Flowers and, um, and Al Ali Stonewright and um, Anna Schaffner. Um, please um, click the links and check out these great writers who were brought to our attention today. And, and, we, and if any more questions, please just type them in the, in the next minute or so. Um, otherwise, I just um, want to say thanks again, and I um, hope to see everyone sometime again. Uh, Mickey, I, I wanted to say the little passage you read about the uh, the the costumes of the clan. That, that's 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 a very powerful insight. Uh, yeah, they're <laughs> because they are not Cossacks. <laughs> they they need a little boost uh, in their uh, you know uh, awfulness. <laughs> Which was a reminder that what they were coming from was a lot worse than yeah. what came across in America. Yeah. yeah.
the way she leads up to that is is great. Her storytelling arc. She was a natural storyteller, and uh, it is admirable that she didn't start. You know, her first book came out when she was seventy five. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There's always time. Exactly. 